one of the things I like about Ron DeSantis is that he's not just all talk. You know, okay, fine, he can make a speech in which the, you know, Florida is where woke comes to die, but he's backed it up with legislation, with, you know, trying to control whether six-year-olds are told that they have to decide whether they're a boy or a girl or something in between. You know, he's put, he is putting constraints on spreading critical race theory in, in public schools. I mean, I, it, it will be interesting how that plays out in practice. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Hello and happy Sunday. Um, this week I am very blessed and lucky to be able to talk to the redoubtable, wonderful, brilliant author and journalist Lionel Shriver. Lionel, how are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm still digesting the midterms. Yeah, no, let's go on to the midterms. What was your take? I'm trying to be cheerful about it. I think I have embraced cheer. It doesn't doesn't seem like a, a happy scenario in that I would have liked to see uh, Biden get uh, walloped because I have been unhappy with his administration, having gone so far left and pretended to be a moderate when I voted for him. So I feel as if I've been subject to bait and switch. And uh, obviously the other big ingredient uh, was Trump. And when I said I try to be cheerful about it, I am pleased with the way the results are being interpreted. I'm not convinced that this interpretation is entirely accurate, but I'll go with it because I like the story and there's a way in which you can make the story true by repeating it enough times. And the story is that Trump uh, has peaked, that he's uh, losing relevance, to the Republican Party, and worse, that he is poison uh, for the Republican prospects in 2024, which is my viewpoint. So that if more people look at things that way, brilliant. Um, and also, I think the result for Ron DeSantis in Florida is promising. Um, and again, it's being exaggerated. It's probably not quite as meaningful as, as it's being uh, portrayed in the media. But I'm, I'm cool with that because I would love it if he got the uh, uh, nomination in 24 for the Republicans. I, 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 I imagine that especially if either Biden runs again or any of the people who are faintly likely to re replace him if he doesn't, uh, if, if any of that lot run on the Democratic ticket and DeSantis were to get the nomination, I would probably vote Republican for the first time in my life. One of my big problems with Trump is that he puts stink on positions that I share. You know, I would like to see uh, the U.S. get control of the southern border, and that should be a moderate position. And uh, it's only recently that the Democrats have embraced open borders, de facto. But, uh, you know, Trump being as he is, he's so clumsy that that's, uh, that's now supposed to be a, first of all, a pro-Trumpian position, and, and also, of course, a, a bigoted one. The left of the Democratic Party thinks that any immigration enforcement is racist, yeah. right? And they don't, they're anti-nationalists, so they don't believe that a country has a right to defend the rights of the people who already live there. They look at it on a kind of global, global humanist level. Um, these people just want a better life. What's wrong with that? You know, they're, they're needy. Um, we, we are well off. We can afford to include them. Um, and and if you don't want all these people in your country, then the only reason you could possibly not want them there is that you are a bigot. Uh, and, and they believe this. We don't seem to hear from people who live by the border. We tend to hear from people who live behind their giant walls, miles from the border. Why do you think that is? They're, they're, they're duplicitous because 
open borders is what you infer from what they're doing or failing to do, but they don't take responsibility for the position. So they have, it's, it's not that different from here in that the, um, they, they're, they're just helpless, feckless. So it's not that they really uh, officially uh, have no immigration laws, but they don't enforce them. And it's all just a matter of passivity and dismay. They're not going to the neighborhoods where these elite Democrats live. I was looking at the uh, 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 a table the other day saying, you know, about big tech investment in political parties. And it said that, um, you know, no, over 99% of certain big tech companies, Twitter, I think, being one of them, are solely Democratic donors. Why do we think this this sort of monochromatic, myopic, um, one party um, investment strategy? And is that bad for the balance of mankind? It's just a certain kind of person that went into that field. And otherwise, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. But uh, the, the country coagulates <laughs> into these camps. And there are certain industries and professions that attract especially highly educated people, over-educated perhaps. I mean, we, we tout the benefits of education all the time in, a, in too vague and bland a way. But what are they really being taught? What, are they really, what do you really learn when you go to university? Most of what I've learned in my life, I have taught myself. Yeah. And I imagine it's the same with you. Well, so I, I usually do it, I have a book project. You know, I, I, uh, my fourth novel, Game Control, uh, the main character was a, de a mad demographer. And that book uh, required me to do huge amounts of research in demography. I think I've de facto earned myself a master's degree in the field. And I've been interested ever since. And I've kept up and I, you know, I continue to read books and update myself. You know, that's not formal education, but it is education. And at the same time, especially in the social scientists, sciences, they're, t they're learning complete rubbish. It's, it's not only not learning something useful, it's learning things that are wrong, that are ideological, that are abstracted that have nothing to do with real life. And the truth is, in both countries, what we really need is more plumbers and electricians and, and carpenters, mm. desperately. And if you really want to make a, a good living, you go into these fields. And instead, you know, we have media studies and, you know, gender fluidity majors. I and mean, it's just, it's, we're wasting educational resources. From positive discrimination, we would find that um, black students have their SAT scores moved up, Asian students down, white students down, or somewhere in the middle. But we were finding then that, America was finding then, or Heather McDonald posits, that they were, that what happened was as black students fell out, or students kind of fell out of um, these sort of high achieving, courses that um, they created an entire new set of courses, social sciences and uh, you know race studies and various things like that in order to understand why uh, these students had not achieved in the, in this, in the course that they had applied to um, do. Why is that, do we think? I mean, if you want to see how useless American education has got, have you ever watched those Vox Pop videos. Can you think of a country that begins with you? They're in the United States, right? Yeah. And, and, and someone will say, uh, utopia. <laughs> or or you, you, try, you go up to somebody and ask them to name a single continent, and they can't do it. They can't come up with one continent. Now, these are all people. They're not coming up to little children right, but people who are at least 18, 20, let's say they clearly went to high school, what good did it do them? What did they learn? They don't know anything. You know, that it's way beyond uh, 
uh, you know, not being able to add two plus two or something. So I first heard about you when I was listening to a podcast and you had been told by your publisher to stay in your lane because you'd made the egregious error of writing a black character into one of your stories. Can you tell me a bit about that? I wrote a short story that had a, a black character. It was actually a very positively portrayed black character, which is the only kind you're allowed to write. Um, and even so, uh, ha had my agent warned me that uh, given my political reputation uh, and my defense of cultural appropriation, um, that uh, it was going to decrease the chances of the story being published. And we, it was indeed rejected by the magazine we, un, well, it was the New Yorker. Um, they reject everything anyway. But um, it was impossible to tell whether it was rejected because I was daring to write a black character. Now, I don't want to misportray my publisher because they did publish a subsequent novel that had a black character in it, and it's the, the I, I knew what I was doing. It was it, absolutely the one character, especially a white writer, must never create, and that's the incompetent diversity hire. Right? So this was the second generation Nigerian who ended up in, in, um, in urban planning job. She knew nothing. And that did get me in trouble. Of course, the, the reviewers were livid. It was it was an outrage, and, but I I did it on purpose. It was you know if you don't if you don't do that kind of thing, then you really can't get away with it. I did have my UK editor implore me to take the whole subplot out, right? It's the best part of the book, um, but in HarperCollins' defense, they still published it. Uh, I said. You know, yeah, I've thought about it, but actually this book really needs that edge on it. And I think that, you know, if literature is going to get out of its despond, uh, it is going to, ha we, we need more people breaking the rules like that. Because it's only obeying the rules that gives these so-called rules any teeth. And if you, if you just say, actually there's nothing against the law about creating uh, uh, characters of other races and... And in fact, I'm going to show you just how much I'm going to ignore the rules because in spite of the fact that I know that I'm not supposed to, look, here is this incompetent diversity hire, so there. If more people just dared to do what they know they're not supposed to do, then the rules would dissolve and we'd have a far more interesting literary landscape. Yeah, but doesn't that just destroy the, the fundamental human universal, you know, that white people can't understand black people or, or the other way around, and we shouldn't just look at it like we're all human beings? Well, it all, it all connects with th the thinking behind identity politics. Um, you know, you're going in that more humanist direction. Identity politics is interested in cutting us all up into, into groups, and they don't intersect. So... It's, it's, as they say, essentialist. It is essentially essentialist. And I'm not supposed to create a black, par black character partly because I don't know anything about their experience. There is no intersection. Being black is completely different from being white in this viewpoint. And so we don't and we cannot understand each other. It's a quite bleak uh, way of looking at the world and at, at people. Uh, and... And furthermore, uh, there's a, an implied commodification of, of so-called lived experience, that being completely indiscernible from experience. Um, so our experiences do not intersect. We are profoundly and completely different. And um, furthermore, our cultures are are they belong to us they're like property they're like real estate and only we are licensed to sell it a lot of the cultural appropriation issue comes down to to money and and a, this notion that white people are copying other cultures and stealing stealing money 
and and it's only only um, an Indian writer should be able to uh, capitalize and sell the Indian experience. You know, when you push them on what's wrong with borrowing a cup of sugar from a, another culture, it, it's, it has to do with the, you are exploiting them. You are exploiting a culture that doesn't belong to you. And exploiting means making money off of it. And by the way, there's no, culture is one of the vaguest words in the world. So who knows what it is? It, it, it affects everything. It intersects with many other cultures. There are not strict borders between cultures. I mean, even this defense of the black experience, for example. What about somebody who's mixed race? Where, where, where are their borders? What do they sell? Well, it sort of seems that we're lionizing the oppressed minority. But I was, um, an Indian guy came up to me in the street the other day, a gay Indian guy, actually, not that it matters. And he said to me, um, I wouldn't want to be a straight white male, an oppressed minority in your own capital city. And justifiably, according to the woke doctrine, uh, able to be attacked. Most of this stuff, if I'm wrong, seems to not come from people of colour. It seems to come from sort of upper middle class white people uh, called Tarquin or various. And why do we think that is? Why do you think that is? I relate it to um, the way w w white liberal Americans have often related to being American. And I, th I think I've suffered this from this myself when I was younger. I was very ashamed of being American. Americans were dissed everywhere. I mean, we used to diss Americans instead of just all white people, but it started with anti-Americanism. And the most ferocious anti-Americans were Americans, right? White, liberal Americans were very anti-American. And it was as if it was possible to opt out by hating it so much. If you hated the United States sufficiently, then you got you were an honorary Swedish person or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think this is also going on with being white. There's this sense of shame and, and uh, low prestige to being white. So that the only way you can earn your way out of the category is to despise it even more than other people do. So it's an odd formulation that doesn't work, I'm, you know, surprised. You know, when I was dissing Americans by way of trying not to be one, it didn't work, mm. right? Lo and behold, I was still born where I was born. And that, that's a fact, and I could get away from it. The same thing with the skin color. I have the, the biological heritage that I do, and it's a fact, and, um, no mouthing off is going to change that. So I, I came around to the view, at least in relation to Americanism, that I was American and I could live with that. I, I didn't choose it. I could have done worse. You know, there are worse places to be from. Oh, yeah. And so I stopped apologizing. And also, you know, you start, you, you realize that these immutables that you are just given when you're born doesn't mean that you have to embrace everything about them. It doesn't mean that, you know, I could, I, I have to say just because I'm not going to diss all Americans that we should have gone into Iraq. And, you know, it's, it's like you can still be, you can still have a perspective. Um, you can still uh, acknowledge that slavery, slavery was a, an historical wrong and it was terrible and, but that doesn't mean that you have to hate all white people. No, and also also the sort of imbalance of the way that slavery is spoken about and talked about, and it's a it's a sort it's of gone nuts. It's get it's a get out of jail free card. But to, so to give them an argument in return, our friends on the woke side of things, when it says that you're all all Americans are born equal, you know we're all born free. Uh, under God, you know, and essentially, you know, it's a very he uh, human rights. 
laden um, constitution, the, there's probably an argument saying, no, they're not. Not all Americans are born equal um, in the eyes of God. Uh, I mean, maybe they are in the eyes of God, but not in the eyes of other Americans. And that um, human rights are, is a sort of nebulous and pointless word. I mean, do you think there is something wrong with the Constitution of America, which is causing this sort of, it feels like America is, is, is on the verge of reforming. You know, Britain, we had this Reforming what? Well, this is what I want to know from you. I want to ask you, because you're smarter than I am. But Britain was, we reversed a revolution, didn't we, with Cromwell, to the point mm -hmm. where we dug him back up and we got the king back. So we reversed a revolution. It feels like America is on the, the is re, it's got a revolutionary energy to it, to me. Do you think that would be a correct assessment? You mean this wokey yeah. kind of revolution? That's another word that I'm getting tired of. Um, we just don't have a, a substitute. For woke? Yeah. Well, there's I'm, a million we, we've worn it out. isn't it? But I, I think it's, nihil it's a nihilistic, it is nihilistic death cult, as right. far as I'm concerned. So, in some ways, the revolution has already taken place because these people inhabit positions of power uh, on an institutional level across the country, and it's happened here also. Yeah. Um, one of the things I like about Ron DeSantis is that he's not just all talk. You know, okay, fine, he can make a speech in which the, you know, Florida is where woke comes to die. But he's backed it up with legislation, with, you know, trying to control whether six-year-olds are told that they have to decide whether they're a boy or a girl or something in between. You know, he's... Put, he is putting constraints on spreading critical race theory in in public schools. I mean, I did, it will be interesting how that plays out in practice. Well, Trump did, Trump did it as well, though, didn't mm -hmm. he? He tried to shut down, I can't remember which university, which declared itself as institutionally racist, and he turned around and said, well, you can't have any more government money then. Until I think that may have been Yale. <laughs> until you've solved yeah. your racism problem. I really like Ron DeSantis. I think he's, he's fab, and also I think he's a much softer edge than Trump. But I sometimes wonder whether you need that punchy... The, the, you know how some people manage to just bring out the truth in others, mm. just by their existence. And he, Trump has that quality, and DeSantis seems to have sort of taken on much of the agenda. Do you think there's going to be, I because I get a very strong sense that Trump will stand against DeSantis yeah, I, in the primary. Yeah, I think so too. And that's going to really, I mean, maybe that will focus the Republican mind, do you think, or not? Um, DeSantis is great on paper. Mm. He's merely okay on the stump. In terms of what his... He's just his, a little dumpy. His whole affect is stodgy, whereas Trump is such a jerk, right? I mean, conspicuously and proudly so. Mm. He weighs a lot in every sense and makes himself difficult to ignore. In being, one of his appeals is that he is so obnoxious mm. and DeSantis doesn't have any of that. Now that's one of the good things about him, but it it makes it harder for him to move crowds. There's there's something outrageous about Trump, and the people who support him really feed off that. Like the, this is not supposed to happen. This is exactly the kind of politician who should never make it past dog catcher. You know, much less to president. <laughs> And it's got some of the same flavor as Brexit because Bre everyone who voted for Brexit knew they weren't supposed to, right? And the people who vote for Trump know they're not supposed to. And it's, that's the one side of the whole Trump thing that I have some appreciation for because it's, I like disobedience, mm. <laughs> right? Well, it's crucial now. Right? More it's never. crucial now. And um, obedience is killing us. Uh, and, and, and the cowardice that goes along with it. So that even the people who are 
who claim to be behind the woke movement, a lot of them are, are just timid and get the feeling this is what you're supposed to believe, don't really think for themselves anyway, and then spout what they're supposed to out of just a sense of self-protection. Do you think that's been something that uh, has always been part? Cause, so I've been baffled and blown away by the last couple of years of, of what I thought was a fairly even balanced debate between human beings, that how many people would just go along with something? Or, or do you think this has been educated into children, compliance, um, you know, the need that one thing is right and one thing is wrong and that there is no debate to be had between them? Well, if you take a, a macro approach to especially the last 10 years, uh, we have been swept by at least four different manias in a single decade. And I don't believe it only applies to the far left. Uh, the best example of which is lockdowns. Now, that wasn't just a matter of a small sector of society getting with the program and bullying everybody else into it. It was embraced almost universally, and especially in places like here and in most of Europe. Uh, there, there, there was very little resistance to it. And now little by little, as we pull away from it, there, there are a lot of people who are pretending that they didn't go along with it or, di or disapproved it. But at the time, and I was there, mm there was virtually no resistance to the sacrifice of every civil right we ever enjoyed, and literally overnight. And I found it shocking, and it, it changed my opinion not only of the British and most Americans and Western society in general, but people. So I think we're dealing with the nature of the species is far more malleable and prone to being told what to do than we admit. And so I look back on all kinds of things that used to seem befuddling to me and, and are no longer. I think that uh, a country like the UK could go f fascist in three weeks. Mm. You know, we, we look at World War II and it's like, oh, what went wrong with Germany? What was wrong with those people? Well, there's nothing wrong with those people that isn't wrong with us. Because you can convince people to believe anything in about five minutes. And that's very worrying. Oh, it's very worrying and depressing. Uh, so, and that's the, the Matthias Desmond thing of the mass formation. It, is that, so we've now pulled this curtain across and we've, we've all seen what's on the other side, which is everyone can be changed in a minute. And Jordan Peterson goes on about the fact that, you know, imagine yourself as the Nazi guard and all of those sorts of things. But it does seem that there has been a, a, a quite a concerted and well-organized resistance to it as well. So do you think that there, this time in the sun for, I mean, I just worry about, I just think about every time universities graduate, I go, you're just graduating me another 10,000 ideologues mm -hmm. who are going to come into our institutions and, and do the exact opposite of what we want them to do. And as you say, Brexit, people voted for it because they weren't meant to, maybe, and they, did, they, did, they were somewhere people. Do you think that there is going to be a shift uh, in, in what's happening? You said that you thought the war was one, but institutionally it's not. God, I ask long questions, sorry. <laughs> Do you, you mean, is there hope for the future? Yeah, <laughs> I could have said it in that. Short uh, I wrote an essay this summer that argued that we were making progress. Yeah. Um, there is an opposition now, whereas when this, when this ca cultural fire, and pr that would probably have been around 10 years ago. Why uh, 10 years ago? Don't ask me. What, but what you say, if you say about 10 years ago, what, what would have been your, the touch paper that says 10 years? When well, the first... first mania that took hold was, it, I identify it as starting in 2012, and that's this obsession with transgenderism. Yes. And w within that year, we were suddenly bombarded with documentaries on television about transgenderism. We're, we've never watched these before. It was astonishing. And I think it was a direct response to the success 
of the same-sex marriage movement. So, uh, I, I, we got, needed a new cause. I've got a, I've got a slight um, unfashionable view, I think, which is that the minute the, the society said same-sex marriage was going to be okay, that the you know those that plan to destabilize and undermine societies thought well what's next then well it it, the it, it turned support for same sex marriage in, into a boring dumpy opinion yeah right it, it, who cares that's not interesting um so you needed a more an edgier an edgier cause and the weird thing about the transgender movement or to me, not weird, but more the significant thing, what makes it important and not just bizarre, is that it the extreme activists really don't believe in the reality of biological sex. And that is crossing an important line. That's crossing reality line. So that's, women, it's so that's not just an interpretation or an ideology and you know a set of ideas that is a denial of truth on a on a substantive level right yeah. and that takes us into cloud cuckoo land seriously and yeah they think that that sex is in your head that but it's and that you, not. and that and by and that you are only assigned sex at birth assigned yeah, but you have. It's like you know the 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 bluebirds and the redbirds in in reception. So we've decided to put you over there capriciously. Mm. It's absurd, well, and it, it would be it would be funny if it didn't have consequences. It's got dre dreadful consequences, but also it, it, for me, as someone who cares, I, I think I'm a bit neurodivergent when it comes to logic and words and the meanings of them. So to to undermine the the pure fundamental of mum, dad, whatever it is, is to is to rip apart everything that actually matters to anybody. And then it feels like a sort of voluntary thalidomide now. It's, you know, it, it's again, at my youngest son's school, loads of trans kids, mm -hmm. but inner city schools, less trans kids. And Fewer. It, yeah, f sorry. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm a grammar nice. Right, right, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so again, it seems to be like a class thing. It seems to be. It seems to be like a civilizational. We've got to this sort of apotheosis of our civilization. We've decided that the best thing we can do is tell kids that they can be boys or girls that they're assigned at birth, which is a which is an attack on, as you say, the truth. But why? Why? Why, why the Trump, why, why is this, this, out of all the things, if you, if someone had tweeted 10 years ago, mm -hmm. transgenderism is going to be, a, or 15 years ago, transgenderism is going to be a big deal. No one would have retweeted well, it's that tweet. I think it is an urge to social destruction. Yeah. Uh, after all, um, what you're doing to these kids is um, usually making it so they can't reproduce if they get it surgery, uh, when you take cross-sex hormones, you're going to severely injure your, uh, your ability to have children. Uh, and you're even, if you give them puberty blockers before puberty, likely to create uh, adults who have no sexual experience, can't come. Mm. Um, it's such a bizarre thing to want to do to your children. I mean, I can't think of anything more destructive. Um, but it, it seems also to come from a, a profound narcissism, which perceives the self in a vacuum, so that you are just what you imagine yourself to be. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's an, an idea of total self-creation. And we're, you know, it's right next door to the idea that you are whatever race you say you are, uh, that you can be a cat or a tree. I mean, we, we when you get into cloud cuckoo land, then there's no, there's no limits. But right? you don't get many Rachel Dolezals. You you know you don't get that many translations. That's because race is so sensitive right now. Well, is it because so, it would be cultural sacred? appropriation right. to decide that that you're black because it's it, because you feel black. 
but but what we what we are privileging now is feelings over facts mm. which is about the most dangerous thing so in is there something to be then said for you know traditional judeo christian religious values you know in terms of looking at things in terms of right and wrong and woman and man and i mean you know are, are there... well we could start with physical reality yeah right I'm, I'm happy just to go back there. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, just the, you know, I'm going, I'm returning to Sunday school every weekend. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, one of my worries is not only is this a fantastic race, waste of resources, because we have enough men and women already, mm. right? We don't need to swap. That's just terrific, you know, waste of, of medicine and money. Um, and not only are we uh, destroying the lives of, of, of children who deserve our protection rather than mutilation, but we are making ourselves look absurd from the outside. When you say absurd from the outside, do you mean in terms of our... Or giving globally... Putin, Putin plenty yeah. of ammunition. He, you know, he looks at us and quite legitimately sees a decadent, decaying... Uh, society that has completely lost a grip. And Xi Jinping as well. So yeah. it's, it's, it's much more dangerous than that. They think we're pathetic. We are pathetic. We are obsessed with things that no one really cares about. Yeah. Know, that, but everything that we read and everything... And I think you could make a case that the whole climate change thing is, is pathetic because it's so impractical. Well, it also, the it's, it's not so much the climate change thing that bothers me, it's the decarbonization thing that bothers it's me. It's impractical. Well, we don't have the technology to do it. Not, y not yet, and hopefully in the future we'll have Blade Runner and everything will be fine, and you'll have little ships going from here to there on electromagnetic pulses, whatever it is. But as you say, it's not sustainable now. We get our solar panels from China. China burns those, uh, you know, builds the coal power plant next to it, and we get them shipped over to us. We get our coal from, from right, our and, power station. Yeah, and they're going to make our electric cars from coal. Mm. Thanks. But that what? makes a lot of sense. And uh, meanwhile, we don't have the electricity to, to, to charge the batteries, nor do we uh, store, have access it. to the minerals that you need to build those batteries. We don't know how to recycle the batteries. And... Um, Congolese children are mining these rare earth Exactly. Mineral, Cobalt mineral. Is, the, yeah. is, is one of the real disgusting... Um, disgusting to mine minerals. None of it's worked out. None of it is practically worked out. It's all theoretical, airy-fairy, wouldn't it be nice, it targets which are based on base 10, that not on science, but just because 30 is a nice round number and 50 is a nice round number. Um, that, but all of these people have lost contact with the material world. And it's the material world that they're supposedly so connected with. So I'm, I'd be open to reduced use of fossil fuels, but show me the technology and show me how it can be uh, jacked up to scale. Well, Schellenberger said, um, he said, if you don't want to see your plastic in the ocean, don't put it in the recycling bin. Yeah. And I just thought... You know, since oh. I read that article, I've started putting my plastic in the rubbish. Me too, because I was in Greece, and I go to Greece every year, same island, been there for 40 years, and I went snorkeling, and there was just huge amounts of plastic in the sea, and I said to them, what's going on? And they said exactly the same thing. They said that Greece has started a new recycling policy, and hence all the plastic ends up in the sea. But in terms of us moving forward, and in terms of us coming to terms with the fact that this utopianism is not, uh, it, it, the practical consequences of utopianism are going to be so negative for everybody. What, is, what can the individual do to, you know, embolden their family, their friends, create more debate, more, more discussion over this stuff? Because we've seen such a suppression of it. What can, what can someone who watches this do themselves? Should they, you know, agree with, with what you're saying and what I sort of feel as well? You know, what can we do? I think on the level of just regular people, the best thing you can do in a small way is allow yourself to say what you think. And that sounds simple, but it isn't. 
it, and it can be quite frightening in certain circumstances to take a deep breath and say, you know, actually I think we should withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights mm. because otherwise we're never going to be able to get a hold of immigration or, you know, no, I don't like positive discrimination. It's, it's discrimination. Um, no, I don't support Black Lives Matter. It's not that I don't think Black Lives Matter, but it's, it's a Marxist organization that has squandered the money donated to it and started a real estate empire. I mean, or whatever you know perfectly well in a given group that you might think to yourself, but don't allow yourself to say. And, and I think that's important. In terms of um, preserving freedom of, freedom of speech, you have to use it. And sometimes that means getting yourself into trouble socially. And that's especially pertinent in Britain because, you know, the, the British, by and large, especially in the middle class, do not like conflict. You know, don't want to get into a fight at a, at a dinner party. And, I, I and I'm not encouraging people to be, a, you know, unpleasant and, or, or, or aggressive. But I think it's conservatives in particular, because they all, unlike liberals, do not assume that everyone they meet agrees with them. They tend to be um, uh, socially recessive. You know, sit back, don't make waves, keep, keep you know, if you have an opinion which is a little risky, uh, you keep it to yourself. The British, in particular, are prone to that, yeah, and right. and a little more ordinary social courage would go a long way to preserving real freedom of speech. Which it, you know, real freedom of speech doesn't isn't just to do with the law. It's about how you feel, and I think that we we're living through a repressive era, not just legally, but socially so that there, a lot of people walk around f feeling that they can't say what they think that it's that there are all these things there are now all these rules and things you, and, and so many rules about language that you know it's better not to talk about whole subjects because you might use the wrong word I think if you start being a little bolder and force yourself to be a little more relaxed about talking about subjects that you have been told are incendiary, I think that we could improve ordinary social life. It's that, it is that simple. It, it's, it's, it's one degree up. It's going into the 51st degree of being able to express yourself rather than staying on 49. Um, just on a sort of, on a kind of end, bringing us round to the end, why and is it true for me to believe and to and to observe that women are being particularly attacked more than men at the moment? W women are under threat. I, I was watching the girls at Penn State who would only talk about what was going through their mind uh, anonymously because mm. they didn't want their future lives affected by saying that there's a guy with a dick walking around in our dressing room swimming as a woman. And they were so frightened of expressing themselves that they had to do it anonymously with their voices uh, disguised and stuff like that. Are, are we looking at a war on women as well? Are we, uh, is there a new misogyny developing? Or has it always been there? I think the radical transgender movement is distinctly misogynistic. I don't use that word very often. It's definitely overused. And uh, I've never looked for pity for my sex. Uh, and I don't think I've especially suffered from being female uh, on, on a, you know, a career level. Only on a biological level, it's physically Irritating. inconvenient. <laughs> um, but, but I don't, I, you know, in some, in some instances, I, I probably benefited from, from being female, be given the era uh, in which I worked. But the tr transgender thing is in is genuinely misogynistic. They really, 
the uh, uh, male to female. I don't quite understand the psychology. I find it baffling. But they seem to, seem to really hate real women. And, and are, you know, are vicious. You don't have to go far to find, you know, rape threats and murder threats and you know, all toward these so-called gender critical women. It's an, I think that's an unfortunate term also. It's such a bad term. It doesn't make any sense to most people. It should be actually sex affirming. Yeah. You know, if you would try to mess with their language, you know, all this gender affirming. I didn't even believe in gender as a thing. I just think that's... I stopped using that word. It's personality, isn't it? Well, it, the word gender has become so politicized that it's meaningless. So and we uh, have to go back to just calling it sex. Am I right in thinking that gender was invented in America by the sort of more puritanical aspects of the church, th saying that they didn't want to use the word sex, so they invented this word gender? Or has it been around for forever? It's been a long, around for a long time. I've got some older dictionaries. Have you? And um, I, I did a column in this, actually. Oh, right. Um, which in which I urge people to keep their older older dictionaries because if you if you use online dictionaries they're changing constantly. I know Mary Webster. But gender used to be a f straight up synonym of sex. The only difference on a dictionary level between gender and sex was that gender also applied to language. Right. Okay. Yes. So that, you know the genders in Men Romance languages, yeah, yeah. like Spanish. Um, but otherwise, completely, completely synonyms. Mm. And what, what the transgender movement seems to be aiming to do is eliminate sex, even the use of the word sex. Nobody in all this seems to be interested in having sex. It's not, that's one of the things that's really super strange. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> um, but, so they, they are getting people to say gender instead of sex. And... The word gender, as for journalists anyway, uh, was always useful as a synonym because the word sex means more than one thing, right? What do you mean? Because it also means the act of intercourse of, of sex. or yeah, yeah. you know having sex. Yeah. So, if you want to be clear what you're talking about, gender used to be a very useful synonym for sex. A formalization of of well, it's the, just of a, the word. it's a, a different word, but, yeah. and you're never going to be mistaken in. That to, I want to, to think that you're talking you. about copulation. No, yeah. you're just talking about yeah. sex. It, the word was uh, co-opted, but mostly by the 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 transgender movement, um, and and little by little it it changed so that gender is what you think you are. G gender is what's in your head. It's what you feel like. It's what you identify with. It's an identity. So it's meaningless. Yeah, and I refuse to use the word. Good for you. I don't identify with anything except. I mean, you cannot. You never meet yourself. You don't know anything except how people react to you. Everything is is based on that and how, what you feel anyway. So it's it's completely obsolete and pointless, as you as you quite rightly pointed yeah. out. So finally, as an American in Britain, uh, has Britain turned out to be what you wanted it to be? And are you happy here? Relatively, but I am disheartened by the state of the nation, mm. you know, for many of the obvious reasons. Uh, it's heartbreaking what's happening to the NHS, which has had been happening already before COVID came along. And thanks to uh, the response to the pandemic, not the pandemic, mm. uh, now it's in even worse shape. Are you a believer in the National Service? I, I am in theory. So in theory, being that there should be universal health care. I like the I, of idea of, 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 a, of a national health service. Would it be a chronic care service? So I, th I, should... I said a long time ago, I thought the NHS should pare back what it does, mm. um, which would include, for example, not doing transgender, transgender surgery. surgery. Yeah. Uh, that is, not doing most optional uh, optional care that is really about dissatisfaction and not about dysfunction. Mm. Um, 
obviously it's not not interesting to say, but it's it's managerially um, too fat, mm. so it needs reorganizing. Oh. And I, I think the whole free this fetishizing of free at the point of care is a mistake. I think paying something would be a good idea that would eliminate a lot of missed appointments and people who are a little, um, well, who are overly worried about their health unnecessarily. Mm. Um, so sort of Swiss model. Yeah, model. but I, it's, you know, the, the having turned the health service into a religion has really hampered the ability of um, either party to do anything about it because it would be perceived as doing something to it. Well, it's, but, big, it's bigger than either party, isn't it? That's yeah. the thing about the health yeah. service. It's more well, powerful. It's, it's, it's God. But it's not working. And because I've been such a strong supporter of the concept, I find it painful to watch it decay Mm. And, you know, it does it, it's, it endangers all of us if, you know, it takes an hour and some to get to you if you have a stroke. I mean, that, that's dangerous. If, if we're queuing up ambulances for A&E, we're all in trouble, potentially. Mm. And this, this is a less safe place to live. And... I, I consider this a tragic, and I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, as far as I can tell, there is no plan. Nobody has a plan to do any serious reorganization, and well, it's just a matter maybe, of somehow muddling through. Maybe if they did a universal declaration of national health service rights, you'd find that we would know what we want to do. But they, as uh, you know, I agree with you. Every time I've encountered the NHS, every time I've been, I've dealt with the professionals who work within it, I've been blown away by how great they are. But the amount of time people spend on social media attacking me just for pointing out the NHS is a bit wobbly and fat and doesn't know what it wants to do and you've got to wait five years for anything to happen. Well, um, if, you, if you care about the people who work for it, then you care about reform because mm. some of the people who who complain most vociferously about the health service or the people who work for it. Exactly. I would, well, I, I know personally, on a personal level, I wouldn't go anywhere near the NHS without someone with me hmm. because of the number, of, the, the amount of abuse I get from it. So I agree with you. The NHS, I love the idea, and I it was very supportive of Obama's universal health care, even though it when you know, I just think it's what a great way of defining a civilization that when you're sick, you will be treated. I yeah. just think what a great way. In the same way as I suppose in, um, you know, to a right-wing American, they go, what a great way I have to defend my constitution with a gun. And a, you know, a Democrat might go, or, you know, a further left-wing person would go, guns are the worst thing ever. But at least they're defining of something. Do you know what I mean? And that's, I suppose that's what we need to get back to as a society, knowing what definitions mean, what words mean. Because we used to have a freedom of speech problem and now we have a meaning of words problem. Yeah. That's what we're, we're in now. But like well, that's, that's certainly, you know, that's the other, the other area where Britain is, if you will, disappointing me. Yeah. Copying the United States in the worst way. In, um, this is the last place on earth th th where freedom of speech should be imperiled. This is this country was the birth of the whole concept, and and the very fact that we now have legally protected characteristics is it's contrary to the British tr tradition. In we no longer the believe, Act. believe in equality under the law. No. Special laws pertain to you if, if you belong to a particular group. And would you repeal the Equality Act? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. would. I think it's it's had all kinds of pernicious consequences. Yeah, I would go with it. So, yeah. and I don't believe in hate speech laws. No. And I would throw them all out. Yeah. So you, free speech comes with hate speech. And it's, it's the one thing that the United States has held the line on. Mm. There are no hate speech laws, and when they're passed, when they're passed, like on a state level, they get thrown out in the Supreme Court, and that's the way it should be.
Well, we should work together. The special relationship must continue. Lionel Schreiber, thank you very much for talking to me. We covered everything. Everything. Well, well not everything. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank Enjoy talking to you. You too. See you later, guys. <laughs>